Today's episode is brought to you by United Faith Leaders, the host of the Faith Leader Directory. The world is looking for your ministries. Be found. Learn more at unitedfaithleaders.com. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Coffee Pot Fellowship Podcast. My name is Jay McNeil, and our guest today is the Reverend Stephanie Sorga Wing. Now, if you're just getting the audio, that's Stephanie with an I-E, Sorga, S-O-R-G-E, and Wing, W-I-N-G. And right away, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you what kind of name that is. Well, uh, Sorga is my maiden name, now middle name, but I go by all three, mm-hmm. uh, and it is German. Um, my dad's first language actually was German. He was uh, born in Canada and uh, immigrated to the United States when he came to college. Excellent. And I didn't follow the Olympics very closely, but Germany seemed to be making a good appearance there, so that's encouraging. And my wife's favorite language is German, so I'll throw that out there too. Yay! Wunderbar. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I I have seen absolutely zero coverage of the Olympics. I'm a little bit ashamed to say, but um, my kids kind of veto that. So <laughs> there it is. Well, I should have said hello and welcome to the show as the first thing, and rather than asking you so much about your name, and like I said, my wife would have recognized that probably as German, but. I got the Spanish in high school and and then some other languages that I didn't anticipate, but all right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's good to be here. Thank you. So Stephanie is a pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Formerly, she was the associate pastor for campus ministry at Davidson College Presbyterian Church, and she's also served other churches in Kentucky. She is married to another Presbyterian minister named Andy Wing, and they have two boys, Isaac and Micah. They are four and two years old, respectively. Both children, and, well, well, actually, this is about Stephanie and Andy. I almost misspoke there. Both are children and grandchildren of pastors themselves. So I feel like I'm getting welcomed into the ministry by just spending this time with you. Absolutely. It's uh, kind of contagious, although not inevitable. My husband and I both have siblings who are not in the ministry, uh, so I at least maintain some hope for our boys. (laughs) They might choose something else, and the other siblings haven't gotten (laughs) banished or anything? Exactly. Yeah, no, it's all good. (laughs) Good, 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 good. Well, the first question that we like to ask our guests really is, Stephanie, how do you like your coffee? I'm happy to say I like it as God intended it, uh, which is strong and black. That's how my dad drank it growing up. And uh, the very first time I had coffee uh, was when I was pretty young. And actually, my ballet teacher uh, had us over for dinner, and she was serving coffee and and asked and said, you know, I'll put so much cream and sugar in it, it'll be like hot chocolate about coffee for me. So that was my very first taste of coffee. And the next morning, uh, I asked my dad as he was making his morning coffee, can I have some real coffee now? (laughs) So I've been hooked ever since. (laughs) Yeah. Are you uh, affected by the caffeine at all? Um, Yeah. I mean, I'm not a millennial as we've kind of discussed in in our correspondence already. Um, And when I was in college, I could drink up to a pot any time of day and go right to sleep. Um, Unfortunately, I now find that I do have to cut it off, um, you know, before before too late in the day Mm -hmm. um, or it will keep me up at night. Yeah, especially if you're drinking it black. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I start to wonder if the sugar is keeping me up sometimes. So. Well, I don't do sugar, so right. it's definitely not the sugar for me. And actually, these days, it's it's more one of my sons keeping me up in the middle of the night than coffee, which makes the coffee in the morning that much more necessary. Right. Well, thank you. So our first story question is to ask you if you have a favorite story, uh, and this can be one of your own or one that you've heard. Yeah. Part of my story and um, I guess part of my formation um, really has a lot to do with 
being in elementary and middle school um, growing up in Durham, North Carolina. The schools that my sister and I attended were in the city school system, um, which was before we were there before they merged with the county schools. And our city schools were urban, poor, mostly non-white, especially as students got older and their parents pulled them more frequently to other schools. So that was such a formational experience for me. uh, And it's one that I'm so grateful to my parents for having because uh, I found out years later that they were really criticized quite a bit for keeping us in those schools. Uh, they were told that they were bad parents for not giving us the best. Um, but I had a lot of waking up moments over those years. And uh, every day I saw how amazing teachers rose above so many barriers to teach. You know, people talk a lot about school supplies today. Well, we didn't even have enough money in the school budgets for toilet paper or soap or paper towels for most of the school year. Um, So our teachers had to buy that. I remember in eighth grade, I was taking a geometry class and our teacher taught us without any textbooks for the first half of the year. And then when we finally got textbooks, they were the retired ones that were totally falling apart. Um, But we took them and used them. Um, The story, though, is from eighth grade. Uh, Somehow I got involved in a peer tutoring program. I have no idea who on earth thought that peer tutoring could be a good idea in eighth grade. (laughs) But um, anyway, I got involved. I assume I had some sort of training. Um, I hope I didn't do any harm. I certainly learned a lot. And I remember one classmate in particular I had known him since he was in kindergarten, uh, since we were in kindergarten together. And he was always the class clown. He was often goofing off. Um, He fell asleep a lot as well. And what always struck me was every single year he got an award on awards day for perfect attendance every year. Uh And it was interesting to me that someone who would goof off or fall asleep most days would be so committed to coming to school each day. And um, so when he came to talk to me, I found out why. Now, most of your listeners probably at this point already know this, but in eighth grade, I didn't, which is that free breakfasts and lunches at schools were his only reliable meals during the week. And so, of course, he was going to come every single day to be fed. Mm. What else I learned is that his dad was in prison and his mom was sick and she wasn't able to work. And he actually had a few younger siblings at home. So he had gotten a paper out sometime a few years earlier. And he woke up really early every morning to deliver the papers before coming to school. So he was the only income earner in his household. And he was 12. And he fell asleep because of the early hours for his paper route. So he would go to school, he would come home, and then he'd have to care more for his mom and his siblings. And at the time, it just really was a revelation to me. I had no idea that kids my age were living with these kinds of problems. Um, So that's just one story. Um, I could have told a few others, though, about how I had really the privilege as a person of privilege in our society of um, of interacting and getting to know those who who are really struggling firsthand, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. Hmm. My original question that I was sort of living with as you were giving the context of this story was: Were you able to get a good education there? And it, you got an education <laughs> of all different kinds, <laughs> right? Um, it's a whole yeah. different context. Or even, you know, that's an insensitive question to ask once you kind of figure out. Yeah, it's fair, though. And, you know, right now I've got two kids of my own and I'm facing decisions about schooling and that kind of thing as they start to get into those years. And my sister actually has uh, has her two boys. Both of us were really impacted by this, and yet she has her two boys who are 10 years older than my boys uh, in a private school here. And um, so that's really been an interesting thing for me to watch. I, I really did get a good education. You know, you can't quantify the education um, that I received socially, 
and in terms of all of those life experiences. But I had some amazing teachers. There were really some very dedicated people who uh, who were smart and dedicated themselves 100% to educating each student that came through those schools, knowing that in many cases they probably wouldn't go on to college, um, knowing that they would be judged more harshly coming out of the gate uh, and expecting um, even more probably from some of those students than some of our peers may have been um, expected in other schools. Uh, in fact, I remember really clearly this one student um, who I was just talking about, he would uh, often find himself apologizing for getting in trouble. And, and one teacher that we had would say, I know you're sorry, now apologize, <laughs> which I thought was just the most harsh thing that she could have said um, and totally uh, not graceful, but, um, but, you know, they recognized, uh, what many of the students would be up against in years to come. Um, we moved just before I started high school to, uh, rural Southwestern Virginia to Appalachia, which has a whole other set of problems in terms of financing the public schools. Um, and I really got a much stronger academic education in my uh, elementary and middle school years than I did even in high school. And uh, and I was still able to go and go to a great school and um, get good scholarships and that kind of thing. So it was really a gift. Yeah, it must have been something to land in. Did you go to Davidson College yourself or no? No, I went to another small private liberal arts college. I went to Kenyon College in um, Gambier, Ohio. Okay. Well, we'll put that in the show notes because I bet a lot of people haven't heard of that. Oh, yeah. A little shout out for your undergrad. Not knowing much about that, I still bet that that uh, private liberal arts school was quite a experience too. I mean, those are <laughs> impressive yeah. contrasts. I mean, what you bring to the table from experience is fascinating. I imagine people don't quite expect that diverse a background uh, from you before you tell them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not off the bat. Right. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. That is fantastic. Um, and certainly helps me get to know you a lot better. That's a fantastic background. And uh, you painted a lot of landscape and picture with that. Now, can I ask you about a biggest trial or blunder in your life? Would you be willing to share a point of vulnerability like that? Yeah. Um, now, this takes us back to Appalachia. And, and actually, for a little bit more background, um, my Christian background is from a more conservative, um, for more conservative faith communities. And um, I've always felt quite a bit out of step with that. Uh, and so much so that when I started high school, um, but then especially in college, I really started to pull away from the church and, and the institutional church. Um, I saw the church, as many people my age and younger see it now, as being judgmental and exclusivist and a place for no, with no room for any questions or doubts. Um, I saw that and experienced that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I stepped away from the church for a while, which is not a unique story. Um, I guess what was unique, I was then working in the nonprofit sector in Boston when I started to feel a sense of call to ministry. And um, I was pretty resistant, which, uh -huh. you know, I think many of us experience resistance. But I think probably one of the biggest things is that I felt like an imposter. I felt like I would be found out for being too liberal or not orthodox enough in my beliefs. I, I felt like my doubts are, were going to come out and come back to haunt me. Um, and in college, I was a philosophy major with a minor in religious studies, and my minor in religious studies really opened up to me a whole new world of understanding the history of Christian theology and Christian thought, and uh, understanding the complexities of questions like orthodoxy. Uh, but I had not encountered progressive Christianity in an actual church. And in my denomination, um, in the Presbyterian Church USA, the ordination process actually starts with the approval of a local congregation through the session. And so the last church where I had officially been a member was the church that I went to in high school. 
And my dad had served there as the pastor for five years. So even when he was there, I never felt very connected there. And I didn't know the pastor who was there since my dad had been gone for a few years already. And I struggled, but I finally came to peace with a place of going through the process through that congregation. Uh, So I started the process there. And then after my first year of seminary, I went to meet with the session for my annual consultation and to request to move on to candidacy, which was the next stage of the process. And when I went, it was just a couple weeks after General Assembly had, um, had, had finished up where, again, issues of sexuality and ordination had been front and center. And so the very first question they asked me was uh, pretty general in terms of how I felt about entering the ministry in the PCUSA at this point in time. And the second question was rather direct. <laughs> One of the elders asked me whether or not I was, uh, whether or not I supported homosexuals being ordained. Now, I will note that this question should have been ruled out of bounds by the moderator, who was the pastor, but uh, suffice it to say it was not. And in fact, the next hour and a half was a grilling, um, to put it lightly. And I, um, was very vulnerable. I was open. I was honest. I affirmed that I would be led by our Constitution, but that I also knew and loved people who were not straight, who I could clearly see had a gift and a calling into ministry just as they were. And so I shared the struggle, and I shared with some of them, um, you know, I shared that I had been struggling with some of the same Bible verses that were often used to condemn homosexuality and that that's where I had come from. Um, But I also believed that God loved all of God's people, and in fact, that uh, God calls a bigger diversity of people into ministry than we might imagine. So after an hour and a half of being uh, on the fire, (laughs) I was invited to leave the room, which is customary, and usually this takes just a few minutes, but I was out for a lot longer than that. And in fact, I kept getting further and further away from the room so that I didn't hear the shouting and the voices. And then all of a sudden the door opened and our elders started pouring out, some went in one direction and others in another, but no one was looking at me. Hmm. And then finally the pastor and two elders remained and they invited me into the pastor's study where they informed me that the session was not voting to move me on to candidacy and that they were, in fact, very concerned about my beliefs and about what I might be learning in seminary, and so they wanted a chance to mentor me. And they made it clear that if my beliefs didn't change, that their recommendation would not change either. Uh, I'm so grateful for the support that I had from a few of the folks at Presbytery. Um, Eventually, over the course of a lot of meetings and um, drama and back and forth, the church actually asked me to move my membership. So I completed the ordination process under care of a wonderful congregation that took me in sight unseen. In fact, I've still never set foot in the cong- in the church there. I've never met anyone from aside from the pastor. Um, and this whole experience both really shook me and also made me question my whole call. Uh, I still had the sense of imposter syndrome always in the back of my mind. And I did this right before I was scheduled to begin my internship with um, what was really the most conservative Presbyterian congregation in Louisville, where I went to seminary. And I just wasn't sure that I could do that. Uh, My mentor listened to me and affirmed that he supported me 100%, even if he and I disagreed on some of those issues. And he affirmed my call and that God was calling me into ministry, um, and his affirmation has often sustained me. Now, that was a huge struggle at the time, but of course, uh, inadvertently maybe, they actually made me even more sensitive to the struggle faced by so many of my LGBTQ plus friends and colleagues who endured and continue to endure so much more than that. So at the same time, I'm much more aware of how my experience pales in comparison. 
And I grieve the ways in which my own caution and coming out as a full supporter of LGBTQ plus inclusion has come across. Um, I've often understood myself to be a bridge builder at times and able to reach across divides and especially to pastor people on different sides. But I'm doing that and I have to recognize that I'm doing that out of a place of privilege as a white cishet woman. I often have the option of choosing silence. And so I continue to be convicted for the times where I've kept silent when my siblings in Christ have been treated as issues rather than as beloved children of God. And uh, honestly, I still struggle sometimes with social media, for example. I know that many of my Facebook friends are extended family members or members of former churches who believe differently and who would see what I say as heresy and condemn me in my ministry. My, um, my litmus test used to be this. I would ask, would posting this make anyone for whom I am called to be a pastor feel unable to approach me for pastoral care? But that's not a litmus test I'm really comfortable with anymore. And more and more, I recognize that I just need to show up and speak up, even when my own privilege would allow me to remain uh, quiet or safe. And so... Um, that too was formational and I continue to be challenged by ways in which I've failed in that call. I was careful not to interrupt because I love you accomplished so much there. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. There were a lot of places I wanted to ask questions or affirm what you were saying or identify with the struggle. Um, um, so thank you for that. <sighs> yeah, it makes it a little hard not being able to see each other, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I was nodding, and you, yeah, you'd have yeah. you'd have known that I was affirming you. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, and that there is so much of struggle and um, standing side by side with folks. Um, and as a straight cisgendered white guy, every time I find myself advocating for a people group that I'm not part of, the way that I am treated um, because of that, it does help me identify with the oppressed group. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, I recognize, recognize it as privilege and that I can usually step away from it. It's a temporary situation for me and there are times where I fail to speak up and be a good ally, but I can never forget how I have been treated in those moments. And I, and I can't go back. I just cannot forget that um, mm -hmm. and live my, the ignorance is sort of gone. Not entirely. Um, you know, even uh, when we had an election uh, 13 months ago, well, I guess the election was more than that. But um, after our last president was inaugurated, there were people of color who were not surprised at all. Um, yeah. And my white colleagues, <laughs> were, we were shocked. We could not believe it. Um, and, yeah. and it was cause it was newer to us. This had been going on forever. It's just another symptom of underlying problems. Yeah. I think Saturday night live actually did some really great journalistic work, um, uh, during that whole election cycle. Um, but one of the standout episodes to me was right after the election and they had a couple of spot on, um, sketches of, you know, white people just freaking out <laughs> and the, the, the black actors. Yep. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> no surprise just from us. <laughs> rolling their eyes at us. Like, welcome mm -hmm. to the real world. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I've had to introduce myself a lot in the last couple of years as late to the conversation. Um, mm -hmm and trying to speak up and do better. And actually, it's still true, but it, I hope that it's less and less true the more that I do this podcast, the Coffee Pot Fellowship podcast, is that I'm. it's like my job to speak up and do it badly and for my guests to help me correct what I've done wrong on this show. <laughs> uh, so people have been absolutely fantastic, uh, and I do hope that we get better and better uh, at moving forward. And uh, being inclusive and understanding how we impact one another and how we're all connected. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. 
I am going yeah. to move forward, and if it's okay, we're going to take a little break, and I'll be back in a minute. Did you know there's a website where you can find just child care? You can narrow your search by babysitters, nannies, daycare centers, backup care, after school, and more. As a Christian minister, I thought, why don't we have a website? When people are looking for a minister, they don't know what church I'm at, what denomination I am, or what support or services I'm called and prepared to offer. I searched and searched for this place, but it didn't exist. Why aren't all Christian clergy standing together? Why isn't there visual representation on the internet? I can understand the church moving slowly to get this done, since we're always slow adopters of technology. But don't we understand yet that the internet is a true meeting space? Thinking more about the website I would create, I realized it would need to be inclusive. The more I have seen hatred and hurt enacted on my sisters and brothers beyond my Christian tradition, I've realized the importance of respect and relationships with diverse people. As a faith leader, this is especially important with the leaders of other denominations and religions. And what's more, the world is increasingly educated about their diverse faith choices. Everyone is creating, as Thomas More calls it, a religion of one's own. This has always been true, but it is only increasingly true as technology expands and our world shrinks. When the public goes to search for faith leaders, they're encouraged when they find us together rather than our isolated silos. Of course, searches can be narrowed in various ways, including faith traditions. Lastly, not every babysitter is a good fit for the public website. Likewise, faith leaders who feel compelled to proselytize are not a good fit with United Faith Leaders. If you are a faith leader who is respectful, kind, and patient, then you are invited to publish your ministries in the Faith Leader Directory at unitedfaithleaders.com. All right, thanks for hanging in there with us today. And it's Stephanie Zorga Wing. Welcome back. Thank you. So our last story-based question uh, asks if you have a happiest ministry moment that you might be willing to share with us. Yeah, I well, I really struggled to think of a single story, um, and I have many, um, and many are moments that are just so full of the Holy Spirit um, and so spirit-led. And I've had a lot of those moments working with college students, um, which I've done both within the secular nonprofit world as well as through campus ministry. And to see um, to see them come to life and discover their calls and their vocations uh, and the work that they do is utterly inspiring and humbling. Uh, and it's an honor to witness and accompany them in the process. Um, and then I would also say that leading worship um, is often a place where I feel these holy moments. Uh, I know that God is always there gathering us together, but there are some times when the Holy Spirit um, just shows up so tangibly in word or in music or in sacrament. Um, and those moments help me to know that I continue to be called into ministry in the local church right now. So not a single story. I can tell you a single story. I just, <laughs> I had such a hard time thinking of one single story of a happiest moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can, that would be awesome. And, and I want, I'm afraid, to, I don't want to push you in a particular direction, but I, I'm you know, imagining you know, the college student or a particular change or conversation you've had with them or, or a particular time leading worship. I know, um, Leading worship in community, I think that the, there are definitely moments where I feel like, like I don't think very often that perfection exists with human folks, but then there are times when, as a collective, I feel like we get it right together, and I feel like those are moments where the spirit is really broken in. Um, yeah. So, is there something that does yeah. come to mind? Yeah, I was thinking of a few other stories, but um, but maybe this is a better one. It's an, an example from a worship service from August 13th of 2017, um, which I know exactly because it's the day after August 12th of 2017. Um, I believe you were in Charlottesville that day, and I was in Charlottesville, and um, I hadn't been 
I was I was actually off for continuing education the week before that, and so I had met um, a couple weeks before that to plan the service with one of the church members, and we had crafted this whole service, you know, well in advance of any of the events that happened in Charlottesville. Um, and then I was in Charlottesville that day. Uh, I was actually volunteering at the hospital, the EVA hospital, as, as the trauma, it actually got locked down for trauma response. And, um, and coming out of that, um, we already had this service planned that couldn't have been any better. What we, what we did is we set up long tables in the midst of our chairs and invited people to join in this uh, participatory process of faith formation, um, which involves um, reading scripture and sharing sharing highs and lows and kind of sharing from our lives uh, and then reading scripture and responding to the ways that scripture is speaking to us and all of that. And then it, um, it concludes by blessing each other. And so we actually had some uh, some healing oil uh, or some oil around the tables and and encourage people to uh, to bless each other with the sign of the cross using the oil with this simple blessing. God loves you, and so do I. Wow. Now I'll tell you a couple of, um, of of quick kind of holy moments in that. When people came and they saw the table set up, um, <laughs> a number of people immediately kind of thought, "Oh, I don't want to talk to people. I just want to be in worship. I, you know, I don't want to don't want to be gathered around the table today." And came out after the service and told me that that's what they were thinking and how utterly wrong they were and how that was exactly what they needed. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but coming a day off of this huge national event that happened just in our backyard, really. Uh, and knowing that there were so many other things that people were carrying as well. Uh, the congregation I serve does certainly uh, is a progressive congregation, but we also have folks on different ends of the spectrum. And I know as I have preached a lot about racism and um, white supremacy and privilege from the pulpit. I know that that has encountered some fatigue. And uh, so this was just a holy space to allow what needed to come up to come up to be heard. And I think every single person that left said this was exactly what we needed. And then that was August 13th. On August 19th, that Saturday, um, one of our beloved church members died suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, He was 54, almost 55 years old. And the moment that he was both blessed and then invited to share the blessing became such a holy moment for everybody involved in that, um, that we had no idea except in retrospect. Hmm. So there's a story from worship. Yeah. Huh. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to take a second um, so before we wrap up, is there something that you would like to promote explicitly before we go? Yeah, I have a few recommendations. Um, and what I am learning um, from my privilege is uh, is the need for me not to be the one speaking and, and being up front. Even, um, of course, as a woman, um, I am uh, facing some barriers in light of my career, but um, I particularly think that racism is something that we all need to encounter. Um, and for white people who have not done the hard work of, uh, uncovering that and understanding that, um, it's very important for us to do that work, but not to, uh, expect our, um, 
brothers and sisters and siblings of color to do that hard emotional labor for free, especially for us. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of resources that I've found that have been really helpful. Um, Sandra Kim uh, has done a whole course on healing from toxic whiteness at Compassionate Activism, and she also has some other courses available from Everyday Liberation. So these are paid courses that um, don't rely on the free labor of a person of color, um, but can really help walk white people, especially through learning processes. A uh, similar uh, product is the Safety Pin Box, which is at safetypinbox.com. Um, and then, you know, I can't leave, we are recording this uh, not long after the Parkland, Florida shooting. And um, we have in my congregation a number of passionate activists um, working to fight gun violence um, who have been for the past number of years. But seeing these teenagers um, coming out and, uh, and being the, the change in the voices that we need to follow has been so important. So uh, I plan to be at the March for Our Lives in uh, Washington, D.C. on March 24th and will um, kind of see my vocation in a lot of ways as listening for those voices that um, are being marginalized, uh, listening for when they ask me to show up and showing up. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm working very hard to show up. And I, yeah. <laughs> I um, yeah, pray that your congregation keeps supporting your showing up. Uh, it's, yes. Most clergy are very overwhelmed, and I understand why they can't be at everything and sometimes can't, or at least feel like they can't be at anything. Um, so I hope that the world works. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I was uh, really pleased to be asked. I wasn't sure why, but um, but I'm happy. I was happy to share a few stories and uh, share some time. Yeah, that's that's all God's doing. So yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And to our listeners, as always, thank you for being here. We know you've got lots of podcasts that you can listen to. I hope this has been encouraging for you. I trust that it has. Uh, please find ways to support this ministry and all that we're doing. So. Thanks for being you and thanks for living into who you are fully called to be.